Hi there, and welcome to the Nerds of Business podcast. My name is Darren Moffat. I'm a director at WebBuzz, the growth marketing agency, and I'm your host. We're about to get into episode four of the branding series. But before we do, I've got some really exciting news. We're celebrating the fact that Apple Podcasts have featured Nerds of Business in their new and noteworthy section. Now, for a new podcast, this is a really big deal. We've picked up thousands of new subscribers, and we now have a global community of listeners that spans 37 countries. If that's you, if you're one of our new listeners, welcome. It's great to have you with us. For a nerd like me, I'll admit this is all very exciting, but it's not the point of the podcast. The reason this show exists is to help you crack the code to growth in your own venture. If we're going to achieve that, if we're really going to make a difference to your life as a leader or business owner, I know our content needs to be amazing. It's why we seek out top entrepreneurs and experts for our panel of nerds and why we're so focused on solving the key challenges all businesses must overcome with a mix of stories and insights you simply won't hear anywhere else. But this show is young and we're still developing, which is why I need your help. If you have any feedback on how we can improve Nerds of Business, I'd love to hear from you. Go to webbuzz.com.au forward slash nerds. That's webbuzz.com.au forward slash nerds. And you can leave a comment or engage with us on social media. You'll find all the links there too. Tell us what you want more of or what you want less of. I'm keen to make this a collaboration with you, our listeners. Let's see if together we can build this podcast into a resource that makes the entrepreneurial journey a little easier for everyone. There's a bit of a theme going on with today's episode, and it starts with our opening story in the era of big hair, fluoro and MTV. Yes, of course, I'm talking about the magnificent 1980s. The year is 1985. Modern consumer culture is exploding. It's the golden age of brand advertising across TV, radio and print. The disruptive force of the internet is still just a futuristic fantasy. And it's the height of what has become known as the Cola Wars. Back in the late 70s, the Pepsi Corporation harnessed the power of TV to amplify a new marketing campaign called the Pepsi Taste Test Challenge. These ads showed real people who seemingly preferred Pepsi over Coca-Cola in a blind test. It was hugely successful, with Pepsi stealing serious market share from their rival. By the mid-80s, the marketing team at Coca-Cola are panicked. They've watched their market share decline 15 years straight, from 60% down to just 24%. So they hatch a radical plan. They decide to rebrand the company. Not just a refresh, but a complete rebrand of the logo, the name, the packaging, even the product itself is updated with a different taste formula known as New Coke. It's a bold gamble. The Coca-Cola leadership go all in and bet hundreds of millions of dollars of brand equity. On April 23, they launch the rebrand and it's immediately a complete disaster. It turns out consumers hate the new product with a passion. The head office is soon flooded with 1,500 complaint calls a day. People start hoarding the old product. A man in Texas buys $1,000 worth of the old Coca-Cola. Protest groups and rallies of angry Coca-Cola drinkers spring up around the country. Even songs are written to honour the old taste. By July, just three months later, the company relents. The old taste formula is returned to store shelves as Coca-Cola Classic. Consumers applaud the decision. In just two days after the announcement, the company received 31,000 positive telephone calls. But the whole sorry saga goes down in history as the most epic rebranding fail of all time. The Coca-Cola debacle is really quite famous, but what's less well known is the postscript. What actually happened after is perhaps the most interesting part of all. By the end of 1985, Coca-Cola Classic was substantially outselling both New Coke and Pepsi. Six months after the rollout, Coke sales had increased at more than twice the rate of Pepsi's. 
So it actually served to re-engage the public and drive sales growth in the product line, which is exactly what a rebrand is designed to do. Today, the Coca-Cola brand is valued $50 billion higher than the Pepsi brand. So although they bungled the implementation, the outcome was exactly what they were aiming for all along. If your brand is getting stale or you're losing market share to a new, sexier competitor, a rebrand might be just what you need to get back in front. These days, rebranding is a bit like sex. Everyone's doing it. But when is the right time for you and how do you rebrand to make it satisfying for everyone involved? I love data. I I love kind of looking through the data. You need to have systems, you need to have structure. You're going to get chopped to pieces. Enthusiasm is unstoppable. We kind of hit a point where we were like, we need another lever. Surround yourself with people who are smarter than you and richer than you. (laughs) This is Nerds of Business. So the problem we're trying to solve and the title of today's episode is Rebranding. When is the right time and how to make it work for customers, staff and shareholders? We'll hear from our panel of nerds in a minute, but for today's feature story, we've got something a bit different. If you're a property or real estate enthusiast, you're in for a real treat. I talk with the Chief Operations Officer of LJ Hooker, Ruth Truella. LJ Hooker is Australia's best known real estate company and in a bit of controversial rebranding, they've recently dumped a famous tagline they've used since, you guessed it, the 1980s. So that's almost 40 years. Here's a sneak peek of my chat with Ruth. You know, it's great to have heritage taglines, but that doesn't mean that you can't evolve those and it doesn't mean you're moving away from the past. It just means you're constantly looking at where you are and where you want to go and making sure that the tagline is still relevant. I think that's why we've kind of gone through that process over time. We'll get to the full interview soon, but first, just a quick reminder that if you're enjoying Nerds of Business, to please hit subscribe on your podcast player. It means you'll automatically receive each new episode every fortnight, and it makes it easier for us to stay in touch. So, if you're a business that's been going for a while, there are some warning signs you should be looking for that will indicate if it's time to rebrand. But before you can do that, you need a mechanism to capture data in the first place. Small to medium businesses rarely have any sort of formal brand tracking in place. Yep. So it's a bit difficult to um, get brand, uh, your the sentiment of consumers towards your brand mm-hmm. and whether you're actually relevant to all customers anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you have some sort of – you should do some sort of research or tracking to – and it might just be customer surveys yep. or you might have a customer panel of some sort, a mm-hmm. consumer panel of some sort. Um, and it might be just a measure of you know your customer complaints and um, some some very little experience surveys in a store or something like that mm-hmm. where you can actually see whether you're being relevant to your consumers and if you're not that that also may be a time to look at a rebrand. Mm-hmm. There's also the um, I guess an, an identity look at it from an identity perspective. So every quarter. I would say you should be looking at you know how you've expressed your brand across all those different touch points, mm-hmm. and if it's starting to as soon as it's starting to look a little bit higgledy piggledy and all over the place, and it's yep. not working anymore, and your designers go, I can't work this through because we're mm-hmm. not we don't have enough breadth and stretch in the in the brand identity, mm-hmm. then that's another key signal for now's the time for a rebrand. How often typically would an established brand? need to refresh it a bit? Like is, is, is there a particular – I know it would vary from industry to industry, but would it be every sort of 10 years, five years? What would be the typical cycle there? Yeah, well, we normally say we're, do, we're working on a brand positioning for five to 10 years. Five to 10 years, And then yeah. the brand identity should – you know, you, you should live up to that as well. Don't, but mm. you, you need to be very careful. I think the thing is that um, – and I remember one of my bosses said once upon a time that as a marketer you get bored of your brand way, way 
quit more quickly before your customer does and yeah. you have to remember that. Yep. And again, this is all about consistency and trust over time. Yes, yes. So you need that element of consistency. So you really do have to be very careful when you are refreshing and revitalizing and rebranding mm-hmm. um, to hold on to the pieces that you really need to hold on to and to be as consistent as you possibly can whilst making yourself relevant. That's Rachel Bevins from The Healthy Brand Company. She's one of our two branding experts for this series, and she's worked with some of the biggest brands in the world. I asked her, what are the practical steps to rebranding and the benefits that a small to medium-sized business can expect? So it's going back to to square one, essentially, and saying... Who are our customers? What's the category and competitors that look like? You know, what do we offer now that's different, better, special to anybody else? And therefore, what do we stand for? Mm-hmm. And how is our how is that being expressed in our identity? Is our identity being um, communicated consistently across everything that we do? Uh, what do we need to keep? What do we need to shift mm-hmm. in order to represent the brand, the revitalized brand positioning, in order to um, to then does that create the new brand identity and move forward? Great. So rebranding really at its core, uh, you could say, is about keeping the business in touch with its customers. Would yeah. that be right? Yeah. Yeah. And on rebranding, um, how can a, a business implement rebranding for best effect so that it works for all stakeholders? What are the key things that a business should do to successfully rebrand? Yeah, again, it's, I, I think you know, alignment actually comes here <laughs> yep. through here as well. So if you're rebranding and you want to now be person, you, you want to be friendly, open, approachable and innovative, mm-hmm. yep. <laughs> you're going to have to take that across your whole, everything that you do. So all of your people are going to need to understand that. Your suppliers are going to need to understand that, whether that's, you know, busy supplying you packaging, mm-hmm. like how do we now express innovative you know what sort of innovative things can we do through packaging or um, the bottle supply or whatever that happens to be so Mm. through your suppliers through your partners through your distributors you know how do we then reflect that brand Mm. um and so that it does work for us so involve all those key stakeholders so so it's got to be it's got to be very strategically planned. It's got to be all aligned across all stakeholders. Um, and again, it goes to that thing of cascading down through all the content and the messaging yep. consistently. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay. And so I guess you would say that rebranding is worth the hassle. Um, if it is worth the hassle, what benefits do businesses, uh, and again, let's focus on those small to medium size your businesses, what do they see? What, do, what, what, what benefits do the business see from the, all the hassle and the cost of rebranding? Yeah, so one is rallying the troops. Yep. <laughs> so everyone's got a, a new, fresh thing to think about. and to, So more to energy, more, more energy, energy in the business. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, more fantastic. More energy in the business and optimism as well. So over time, you know, things get a bit fusty. So yeah. it's like let's put a bit of energy and optimism and enthusiasm back in the business Great. and brand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think that is is number one, and that's essentially what then helps you with the, all of everything else that you need to do anyway, because they'll come up with the right products, then the right service mm-hmm. attitude, the you know the the um, your beautiful environment, your store environments, or your website environments, or whatever it is, mm-hmm. is so, the, so, uh, the customer experience and the user experience. Mm-hmm. They'll be on board to create those. Um, yep. They'll be enthusiastic and energized. So energy, enthusiasm of the staff. But I, I would guess also another benefit would be, you know, press uh, distributors, yeah. partners that might be a little bit jaded, used to seeing the same old thing. All of a sudden, they give you a fresh look. Yeah, it does. It gives everyone a bit that bit of revitalization. But sometimes a company or an individual has no choice but to rebrand because of damage to their reputation. Their brand becomes mired in a crisis that's so serious that unless they can reset the public perception, it simply becomes unviable for them to continue in the market. For this, I turn to John Michael from The Image Group. John is our other branding expert, and for over 30 years, he's been a leading image consultant to top names in business, sport, and entertainment. John reveals what really goes on behind the scenes when rebranding is less a choice and more of a necessity. Well, 
there's so many, but I mean, the obvious ones, the big ones, mm. obviously, is you know, damaged reputation, yeah, um, bad leadership, yeah, um, you know, product reviews that really have created all sorts of uh, drama for the company, yep, um, and scandals, yep. Now, you can link that specifically to personal or corporate brands, yep. yeah. Uh, also societal expectations. So for instance, and this is the thing, you know, we've entered different times in society. Um, so uh, companies, for instance, might have to reposition themselves in different areas, i.e., uh, you know, diversity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. It doesn't matter 30 years ago what you did. Mm-hmm. The society expectations have changed. Yeah, so you got to keep up with the times, okay? It's a bit Darwinian, by the way. The core of the business and the way that uh, those, the people in the company do business, we're talking really about culture here. If the yes. culture is sound, you can rebrand and you can relaunch and you can go on to become a success. But, but am I right in thinking that if the core is unsound and if the way – those people do business is poor. If the culture is is rotten, then rebranding over the medium and long term is not going to make much difference. Is that right? Yes, yes. And again, um, you're spot on. Uh, but I still have a caveat on that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, for instance, Weinstein, right? Yeah. Is finished. Yep. Even if it comes out, he's finished. Yep. Right. And he had a lot of money and power. Mm. But in my experience. There's, you know, there is guys that are what I call us sacred cows, okay? So, um, for so what I mean by that is they might have done all sorts of stuff, but they're all protected. Um, you know, and I don't know how your listeners are going to react to that, but for somebody that's had the experience in part of that world, um. That's the way life is. That's the way it works. They're, they're, you That's know, the way it works. If you've got the money and you've got the influence, uh, you can you can buy the protection, you can pay people off. And, and I think, you know, the, the Weinstein um, scandal is a great insight into that world because it has lifted the lid for everyday normal people to see how things really roll at the top, you know. And... You know, you're you, you you're you're part of that world. You know some of you know some of these movers and shakers, maybe not you know, directly in, in in the American film industry, but locally in Australia. Well, no, I have worked in there. I, and I've I've done Broadway and Hollywood. Wow. It's bottom line, man, it's power and money. Yep. That's the reality, you know. And that's why, you know, I've I have insights in what's going on right now, right? Because it's always about that in the end. And a little bit of fear thrown in. So you might be getting a sense that there are dozens of reasons why companies rebrand. Often it's just a refresh, but sometimes a complete name change is required due to mergers or reorganizations of internal divisions. And this was the case with $250 million internet business finder.com.au. Their co-founder, Fred Shabesta, shares the story of why they rebranded and how auditory or sensory elements played an important role in bringing it all together. Creditcardfinder.com.au was obviously our starting domain, and then we, we registered home loan finder.com.au, personal loan finder, savings account finder, you know, mobile phone. It, we have, it was like a stable of finders domains. Mm-hmm. Um, when, but when we moved to saying finder for the first time, it was very uncomfortable, actually. Everyone, oh, okay. Very uncomfortable. Everyone was like, oh, Finder, like, who? What is that? And, you know, we just say, oh, you know, we're like X, Y, and Z, say some bra- other brand name that they know. And over time, we, we, we got, we sort of couched it. And I think what solidified it for us is when we made that jingle. Yeah. And I have this theory about, so, so, so to, tr- to transition a brand, I have this theory that if you haven't got something to say that's interesting, go and sing it. And nice. and that's where that's that, that's where the whole thing came from. That's where you know? it came from. Yeah. There is actually a whole finder song, by the way, if you go on Spotify and, and look for Beyond Compare Extended. That's nerdy. That is very nerdy. <laughs> that's really going down into the into the into the finder brand rabbit hole. I love it. 
Okay, I'm going to seek that out. There's a reveal for you. Um, and it's um, it's a national rap song. Um, Are you rapping for it? No, I, I can't rap, and I don't. I, I'm not. I don't have a skill like that. When we first played it, everyone sort of lost it, and I made it my ringtone, and I knew this was the one, and I started really spamming it, and people lost it, and they, but they were like, "I went home last night, Fred." And just before I went to bed, I sang the jingle, <laughs> and that was the moment in time where I thought, "Okay, this is this is not more than something." This so is it became a, an earworm, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think that's when people got comfortable internally. So you see, I think the first step about rebranding is you, you've got to be comfortable internally because everyone's got to live it. And then you can go out to market and start to explain it, right? So the PR team tend to talk about it with the media, the you know, advertising, what we're going to write, uh, how we're going to write on the website, how we write about ourselves, our About Us page, you know, critical parts, home pages. So once that became kind of fun and cool, people were like, hey, I'm going to own this. And then I think it. Then I think the change management. I think that's what you're referring to slightly as well. Yep. Became a lot more comfortable. Yep. And the 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 moment in time when we actually folded creditcardfinder.com.au into Finder was less painful because we felt, hey, this gives us a great platform for the future. And people got excited about that. Yeah. I've got a big problem, but with it. And, and I'll share that. And it's very hard to sing finder.com. So in the US when I'm there, you know, I was just there, I just came back. And, and so you can't sing finder.com.au. And, and so anyway, so it doesn't quite It has work. less of a sing-songy. Right. Yeah. It's finder.com. It's for you. I don't know. You know, well, we're, you, we're could, you could get Sia. Sia is great at stretching the syllables in words. And if you listen to her music, She's so she would probably do something like, and I've got a terrible singing voice, but finder.com, like something like that. Nice. She really stretches it out. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have Sia's number, but you know, um, it's all right, it's an idea. Yeah, I'm sure we're we'll, you're your friends with her on Facebook, so you know. And now for our feature story if you grew up in Australia or New Zealand in the 80s or 90s, you'll recognize this iconic ad jingle for maximum returns on your investment property. But nothing lasts forever, apparently. And in March 2020, LJ Hooker refreshed their brand by announcing the new tagline, When you know, you know. I spoke to Chief Operations Officer Ruth Truella about this. She generously shares the story of how her company has made this work across a vast network of offices, business units, staff and franchisees. For anyone thinking about rebranding, what you're about to hear is a short masterclass in how to do it well. The first mystery I wanted to solve, though, was if the old tagline has been so successful in making LJ Hooker such a loved real estate brand, why replace it? Well, look, there's no denying that nobody does it better, and also LJ Hooker, to its best, um, have definitely made us one of Australia's most iconic brands. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, taglines are um, a bit like mini mission statements, and each of them successfully spoke to that. So I think they left the viewer with a positive feeling about our brand. Um, I think consumers are still nostalgic about them today. Um, you know, you don't need to tell someone um, what you do when you say you work for LJ Hooker. People often say to me when, when I say I work for LJ Hooker, oh, thank you, Mr. Hooker, or, um, you know, nobody does it better. So it's definitely something that's resonated um, over the years. And I guess it's a key indicator um, of a strong and successful brand um, and that it's also stood the test of time. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, from one perspective, it's a pretty brave move to retire such an effective piece of messaging. What led you to the realisation that it was time for that change? Yeah, so I guess we don't really view it as having retired them, more so we've evolved them. Mm -hmm. um, I think as a brand, you always have to grow and evolve to stay relevant with customers. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of consumers in Australia who didn't grow up with those ads, me being one of them. And um, so we've got to make sure that we're, you know, we're, we're staying relevant to the consumer of today, whether they know our brand from the past or not. 
um, and just making sure that we're, we're still relevant. What was the process for coming up with the new tagline? When we reflected on Nobody Does It Better and LJ Hooker, You're the Best, um, it very much spoke to us and not necessarily to the customer. Um, and, you know, we firmly believe that the customer is at the center of everything we do. And so that was this, the turning point. And that was the background with which we kind of started the process. So we made sure to uh, that we involved our, our network. So we um, worked with a small group of our business owners within the network and some of the um, the offices that, that do marketing um, in, in a really, really great way um, and who've been successfully using um, the taglines from the past. And we got them together and we did a series of workshops um, around what those taglines meant to them back then, what they might mean now and what a tagline might look like in the future. We also did a lot of uh, work around what our values are and and what we what we live by day to day, and um, and also the values that are particularly unmistakable as LJ Hooker, and as part of that, kind of came up with one statement, which was the starting point for coming up with the actual tagline, and we we all centered around one one statement, and that was that we place people, trust, and results at the heart of everything we do. And it kind of just built from there. So we then um, we worked with a with a creative agency um, and kind of workshopped through all those values until we kind of came up with that last statement. And obviously, there's there's with multiple iterations of that to get to the final tagline. And and then we had to kind of sit down and make sure it worked in every scenario because we're not just dealing with um, buyers and sellers. We're also see, um, dealing with um, landlords and tenants. So it's got. We had to make sure that it would flex in every market in Australia, because it's got to work in Darwin, it's got to work in Double Bay, it's got to work in Western Australia, South Australia. So we had to do quite a bit of work to make sure that that was going to resonate. Um, and and then we brought everyone back um, and and gave them a preview of where we got to. Thanks, Ruth. That's such an, a a really great insight into the process. And what I find so interesting about that is that you started with the staff, you started internally. Sounds to me yes. like it was a fairly organic, real process before you inevitably got uh, an agency involved. And, and I can see that in the way, you know, the, how you've applied that, um, the tagline across the different offerings. And, and, and there's a real nod to the, to the history of the brand too, yes. because it's very much about the, the experience and the length, you know, the length of time that the LJ Hook has been in, in, in the market. And why did you settle on this particular one? So, I mean, as you yep. alluded to, there was a, you know, it was an iterative process. There were no doubt, you know, many different options along the way. Why did you choose when you know you know? So I think um, there was a couple of things that came out as, as a brand through this process. So we're clearly a trusted and heritage brand. So we didn't want anything that was too crazy. It needed to be simple and yet resonate. Um, people are obviously at the heart of everything we do, as I've said, and that we're innovators. So we've been an innovative brand for the last 90, almost 92 years. And I guess with these things in mind, we wanted a brand statement that was strong, but also flexible. And at the end of the day, when you're particularly when you're buying or selling a home, it's one of those massive life moments. It's often the biggest asset you'll ever own. Um, and therefore, it's an incredibly emotional decision. So we wanted to re- refer to that emotional side of decision making. So that gut instinct. So when you know, you know. Um, and we felt that that would, um, you know, put that human element um, into the statement, and um, but also that that nod to the past around being an incredibly knowledgeable brand for the test of time, and that's how we landed on that. Yeah, well, look, as I said, I, I, I'm quite a fan of it. I think it's really strong. And, and the other two things I really like about it that's very clever. The first is that when you know, you know, is part of the vernacular. You know, so in Australia, yeah. people often use that term you know oh you know when you know you know so it's part of the everyday language so that's that's one thing that I really like about it but the other thing that's very very clever is that and any copywriter will appreciate this is that you've got the personal pronoun in there twice so when you know you know so yeah. uh, I'm, I'm getting very technical here and maybe that was you know not a deliberate ploy but uh, it didn't escape my attention that the personal pronoun is is in this tagline twice so it's it's got that that sort of double punch of that emotional connection, if you will. So established brands you know, regularly need to be refreshed. And I can see LJ Hooker has you know, um, touched up their, their branding um, quite regularly, sort of you know, every 
uh, five to ten years or so. Why is this important in particular for real estate brands? Um, and when you're dealing, I guess, um, with someone's biggest asset, they want to know that they can trust you. So we just, I guess, we look at the brand um, over time and make sure that that statement is still relevant for the the current real estate market. Obviously, the market goes up and down over time, um, and pe- and how people view it can change over time as well. So we just want to, we I guess, we look at it as an opportunity. Um, to uh, remain relevant, but always stay true. You know, it, it's great to have heritage taglines, but that doesn't mean that you can't evolve those, and it doesn't mean you're moving away from the past. It just means you're constantly looking at where you are and where you want to go and making sure that the tagline is still relevant. What plans uh, does the business have uh, for rolling out this latest refresh to the market? Yeah, so we started... Um, a bit of a pre-campaign, I guess, uh, with our offices, just getting them across all of the different taglines and how they could use it, introducing them to some of the new creators because it's really important that they understand how to activate it in the market and in their local markets as well. And then we moved into um, um, a national campaign. So we used um, digital digital uh, displays in over 250 shopping centres around Australia and we backed that up with a with a with an online campaign as well, just with that overarching national statement. Um, so when you know um, when you know home is where the heart is, for example. And then with phase two, we've actually um, localised it um, and we've started to hyper-localise it with our, with our offices so that they can leverage it in their own um Marketplace. So, for example, when you know um, when you know your local cafe is the best place for coffee, but you'd obviously insert whatever the local cafe name is there to allow them to hyper localize it. Mm. And then we'll go even further um, with more of um, with more localized, I guess, uh, statements. So. You know, when you know Newtown is where you belong, when you know Sydney feels like home, when you know it's time to upgrade, when you know it's time to uh, for a seat change. So we're just gradually rolling it out and looking at which ones resonate best through our digital campaigns. Mm-hmm. Then we feed that back through our offices and let them know, look, this is working particularly well in, in your state or in your locality. We recommend you localize it further. And that was the idea with when you know, you know, as well, is that it has so much flex. So we can use it in so many different ways for multiple life moments or locations or even or even agents, for example. Um, and so we'll just gradually continue to, I guess, to get deeper with the message, but always do and um, taking a test and learn approach. What's working, what's resonating, what's not. And then we retire those. Um, and push out the uh, the messages that are working the best in whatever particular region we're looking at at the time. So the problem we set out to solve in this episode was rebranding. You know, when is the right time and how to make it work for staff, customers and shareholders. Our branding experts, Rachel from the Healthy Brand Company and John Michael from the Image Group, revealed how it works and the main reasons why companies rebrand. And we've also heard some compelling, true stories from our guests, Fred Shabesta at finder.com.au and Ruth Truella from LJ Hooker. I hope their wisdom and insights have given you some ideas to crack the code to growth in your own venture. For me, however, there are three important conclusions we can all draw from this episode. Firstly, you need to involve your staff, suppliers, and even customers. You need to make the process as organic as possible. Remember, brands aren't abstract. They're a collection of people and human processes. So the more you involve key stakeholders, the better. Secondly, you should have some basic mechanisms in place to alert you to when it's time to rebrand. Sometimes brand damage or crisis drives rebranding, but more often it's because the brand has lost relevance or meaning in the current marketplace. Finally, Flexibility in your rebrand is essential. Going back to episode one, you might recall Rachel Bevins talked about fix and flex as the most important aspect of any brand identity. And this was very evident in the LJ Hooker example too. As we heard in the Coca-Cola story at the top of the episode, 
rebranding can backfire when handled badly. But if it's done well, like at Finder, it can be the making of your company. As for LJ Hooker, it's still early days, but what their story does show is that even the biggest, strongest brands need to regularly refresh in order to stay relevant to customers. And that's a message that all businesses, no matter how small, should heed when planning for the future. We're coming to the end, but before we go, it's time for our regular segment, Nerd Under Pressure, where a guest has to share one killer hack or tip they recommend for you, our listeners. Let's find out who is our nerd under pressure today. We've got a recurring segment at Nerds of Business called Nerd Under Pressure. So nerd under pressure, Ruth, uh, today you're our real estate nerd. You know, obviously you know a lot about the marketing and the branding within the real estate industry. Um, uh, what is one killer hack or tip that you could give, you know, a, a small to medium-sized business out there perhaps in particular uh, yeah. for rebranding or refreshing the brand? I'm going to give you five seconds thinking time. Your time starts okay. now. Okay, over to you. Okay, um, I think it's uh, don't take things too personally. Mm-hmm. Rebranding and refreshing is a very person can can become a very personal piece of work, especially if it's your own business and um, that you're rebranding or refreshing. Not everyone is going to love what you come up with, yep. but stick to your guns and try not to be too emotional about it. Always have that perspective of. Is it going to work in the marketplace? Is it going to work with my consumers? And not everyone has to love it straight away. Oh, fantastic. I think that's a wonderful insight. (laughs) So thanks for listening to the fourth episode of Nerds of Business. If you've enjoyed it, please leave a review on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to your podcast. It helps us climb up the ranks and become more visible to other people. We want to help as many entrepreneurs and businesses as possible. Uh, If you've got a question or some feedback, we'd love to hear from you. You can engage with us at webbuzz.com.au forward slash nerds. That's webbuzz.com.au forward slash nerds. So feel free to reach out and say hello. Uh, I want to thank all of our guests and the team at Webbuzz for helping me put this show together. Uh, We'll be back in two weeks with our next episode, which is a big one. It's on brand awareness. And the fastest way for even a lazy entrepreneur to get people talking about their business. Until then, I'm your host, Darren Moffat, and I look forward to nerding out with you next time. Bye for now.